this song actually, the one we're about to play, I'd like to talk about it before I tell the story actually, if you don't mind. I don't mind. This is, this is the first song we did, isn't it? Uh, this is the first song that we did. Uh, uh, I, um, Possum said, well, how, is it, how is this gonna work for best for you? You know, I'm sorry. It's okay. You guys caught it long before I caught it. I'm sorry. This lovely man sitting next to me. He says, uh, you know, how do you, how, what's best for you? How do you want it? I said, look, I got three kids, a job, and a wife, and I'm running all that. You know, I gotta do this and I gotta do that. I said, you know, you just, we'll get together when we get together. You tell me a story and then I'll go and come up with whatever I can come up with, hand it to you, and you can take it and run. Do with it what you want. And then we'll move on to the next one because I only have a limited amount of time. And plus, I was leaving the country in like two months from us starting this project, you know. And, uh, and so we had a very limited amount of time. And uh, so the first, uh, the first story he tells me, we meet there somewhere at the square, I don't know, we're walking around, and he tells me the story, and I take notes on the story. And at first when he told me the story, I thought, how in the world am I gonna make this a song? This is the craziest thing I'd ever heard, you know? And uh, that was my first insight, because I hadn't talked to him in three years. I didn't know what he was up to. I mean, I knew he was on his bike riding around, but the whole going to Afghanistan and all that stuff, I had absolutely really no idea. So to hear, you know, this story that came directly from somebody in Afghanistan, he says, I'm going to make this a song. And I thought, oh my gosh, how, I don't, you know, uh, I'm going to write a kind of a folky song <laughs> in, in place of somebody else. But, you know, I, after the conversation was over and we, wanna, we went on, it, it dawned on me immediately, uh, you know, well, it just, need to be, it just needs to be sung as though that person was singing the song as though it was that person in Afghanistan on some farm somewhere, you know, this is his song uh, that he's singing. And, and that's kind of, that set the stage, I think, for the, for the rest of the songs that we did on this album. I, don't you? I think that it... Yeah, that, this was really intense when he came back with this and the first time he's... Y'all have heard Adam sing before, right? He's probably one of the most beautiful singers I've heard in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes back, he's like, here it is! And I'm like, oh, I can't sing that song. Are you kidding? <laughs> There's no way. I said, sure you can, sure you can. You just got to, you know, open up your throat. It's fine. Yeah, he did. He actually coached me. He changed how I perform as a musician. It changed me as a singer. And one of the key things he told me was like, remember, you remember how you would sing at the top of your lungs at church? Because we both grew up in church. We grew up in the Baptist church in Danville. And uh, he was like, sing it like you're in church. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I can do that. I'd, I'd pack that, that voice of that person away long ago, but I really unpacked it to, to dig into this album, and it really changed me. So I went through the process of learning this song, singing it over and over, and uh, I couldn't sing it through without crying. Uh, and finally one day I sat down, and I was like, look, I'm going to sing this song over and over until I can do it without crying. Make it all the way through. <laughs> it took me five hours. Wow. But what I realized in the days after this and going through this with the rest of this music was that that was a profound healing technology. There was a serious catharsis that went into doing that. And once I had sang that song out and locked it down, a part of me felt a little, a little different, a little lighter. My load had gotten a little bit lighter. So that's one of the amazing gifts that Adam that Adam gave me uh, through working on this project. It, it really was, I could, I, knew, I mean, I know I'll say it a thousand more times, but it, it really was a life-changing experience for him just to go through, I mean, he had a healing process that he went through and I had, you know, I had a very similar healing process that I went through that just, it just changed me as a man. It was very fascinating to go through and lovely to go through. It's something I would have never been able to go through had I not known this man, mm -hmm. you know? So. I hope y'all don't mind us just loving each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna get a little goofy. Yeah, it's, right. yeah, it's just gonna get better and better. <laughs> so I'll tell you the story behind this song. And this is what I told Adam in a nutshell. It was about midway through the delegation in, Af in Afghanistan. And uh, a little side note, when I went back, uh, 
my mom's now uh, ex-husband. Sorry, mom. <laughs> he he got deployed to Afghanistan the same month I went back to do peace work. He's in the Navy. He had already been in Iraq. He'd been a public relations uh, liaison at Guantanamo Bay, if you could imagine doing that job. <laughs> Basically, they tell you the truth, and then you have to tell the, the, the public something else. So uh, basically, we went over there at the same time. So that was, that was very interesting to go through. Because my mom started having to deal with it, like PTSD and all these things when he came. Actually, while I was over there. Uh, and that, that helped yeah, in us. In between deployments. And yeah. yeah. Okay, he's also a federal law enforcement officer. So he get, he's gotten it from a lot of different angles. <laughs> so I, this was about midway through. And uh, the boys were like, Jacob, we got to take you somewhere today. And uh, I didn't know if I was excited about that or not because I'd been pretty worn down. I'd just been there for a couple of weeks, but it was a lot to go through. And there was no other vets there with me. Uh, one was there for a couple of days, but, but for the most part, I was on my own. And uh, they said, well, we're going to go to a landmine museum today. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> I was an explosives expert in the Army. And uh, I'd spent my fair share of time around explosives in Afghanistan. And I wasn't too psyched about standing in a room full of them, but uh, I did it. So we get to this, we're going to this building, and, and uh, we arrive in this building. It's not much bigger than this room, actually, but quite a bit smaller. And. Uh, Outside the building, they have what the Afghan youth peace volunteers, that's what they call themselves, called the, the tombstones of empires. They had uh, Russian tanks out there and, and Russian MiGs, which are fighter jets from the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan through the 80s. Their whole country's littered in, in war. And uh, we walked inside, and the first person in the door is this really hard-faced Afghan man, very serious. And he looks at us, he's the only person in there. He welcomes us to his museum. He takes us around his museum and tells us all these harrowing acts of Afghans pulling these explosives out of the ground. Uh, and how he knew a lot of them. He was a supervisor on a demining team. And uh, it was just heartbreaking. Because, you know, I'm a farmer. I come from a farming family. We grew up raising chickens. And uh, to have to listen to them talking about pulling these things out of the ground was, was, it was devastating. But it was also very inspiring. Cause it's a very brave thing to do. They don't have fancy equipment. They do it with sticks. It takes a lot of grit. So we get back to the door of the museum and... It was just a room basically with tables with explosives everywhere. And he goes, I'd like to ask y'all a question. How many things in this museum do you think were made with the hands of the Afghans? And there was silence. I knew the answer to that question because I recognized a lot of things in the museum, but I held my peace and, and everyone. There was some other, there was some other uh, international people there, so they were just kind of diddly dad and and uh, he's kind of tapping his foot and just kind of waiting. Finally, he goes, nothing. <laughs> Not a single thing in this museum was made with the hands of the Afghans. You, the international community, have turned my country into the playground of war. You bring your toys here, and you play, and we suffer. We used to have farmers working our fields, harvesting potatoes, with plows. Now, we work our fields with wooden sticks and we harvest explosives. He said it'd take over a hundred years to clear every single landmine out of Afghanistan. Work it seven days a week. He also said that this museum was a fundraising tool because Afghanistan lacks the infrastructure medical infrastructure to pay for prosthetic limbs for everyone who's wounded through the course of doing this. 
and to provide income for family members who were killed. And then he says, I'd like to ask y'all one more question. Would anyone like to make a donation? I've never seen so many people scrambling for money in my life. <laughs> it was wallets and change falling all over the place. This guy was a good fundraiser, <laughs> I'll tell you. But his story is very inspiring. This is the first song where I ever tried to sing or channel an Afghan. It's called Playground of War. So here I stand in this building so small, a museum of ways to kill the soul. And why do you ask, do I risk my life? Oh, my friend. My kids and my wife. Not a single toy in this playground of war was made with the hand of the Afghan so tall. And who did I ask to make this the plan? to make me a refugee in my homeland. Three decades of war we Afghans have had. From the USSR to those American lands. 
and a graveyard of empires we find ourselves in. I'll chasing the ghost of Ben Laden's now with gentle hands and nerves of steel. I dig through the ground so we can all hear. And I'm working my fingers straight down to the bone. And the difference I make in this place I call home. Oh. So, okay, so some of this stuff is a little heavy. <laughs> and my, my goal tonight is not to cry. Yes. I, I almost lost it. I was honest. just about to say, <laughs> a very important part of healing from war is allowing yourself to grieve. And it took me a long time to come to that. But... A very wise medicine woman from here in Arkansas actually told me that grief is pain trying to leave the body. And if you don't let it leave, it can cause all kinds of dis-ease to occur around the body. So through the course of tonight, at any time, if you feel like you need to grieve or cry, please, please do that. That's what this is for, is so we can get together and in some way start the healing process from these wars. We're all affected by this, we're all touched by it, and we all have to heal from it. So please grieve with us. <laughs>